Well, Helen, I'm so glad to have a few minutes with you. It's a pleasure to meet you and your husband. And I would just like to start Likewise. the, the uh, tape rolling and just kind of glean from you some of your memories and some of your stories about being in the music industry. I think a good place to start, just to give us a little bit of background on yourself, is uh, tell us where you grew up and did you have a lot of music yourself when you were a young girl? No, we had a player piano at home and I always wanted to play the piano. But again, we could not afford it. We could not afford a teacher. And Joe Ravella, I used to play by ear. I hate when people say that because how can you play by ear? But I used to play. I, I had my study periods switch to orchestra period in school. And I would sit there and I would in my mind work out these tunes and come home and play. So my mother did call Joe Ravella to the house. Mm. And he said, I'd, I'd like you to listen to Helen and see if you think that um, we can come to an agreement on some sort of lessons and so forth. And he listened to me play. I was playing the, some of the tunes that the orchestra was playing. And he said, Mrs. Donata, we'll ruin her if we give her <laughs> lessons. And I don't know if that was just a cough out we don't want this girl playing piano or what, you know. But I, I, I did uh, kind of play by ear, and I enjoyed it very much. Of course, again, it was a player piano, but it didn't matter. I really loved it, loved music, but we could not afford lessons. Tell us a little bit about your childhood. Was it here in the Pittsburgh area? It was in McKeesport, okay. And uh, mom had a big family, and we were extremely poor, extremely poor. But, you know, everybody says nowadays kids have everything. But you know what? I personally don't think they have anything, honestly. They may have all the material things, but we, we got so much enjoyment out of just being crazy, you know. I mean, who at the age of 18 sits on a curb on their street and plays, I see something, you don't see it, starts with an S and ends with an E, you know what I mean? Instead of being out in a, on a date somewhere, you know. We, we really enjoyed our childhood. I mean, there were everything, we were limited on everything, but we loved it. We loved our parents and we loved our family and that was more important than going anywhere, you know. So, uh, uh, senior prom, for example, I went to church for six months and said the Stations of the Cross so I would be allowed to go in my senior year. And so mom borrowed a gown for the prom and uh, I had to be home. The prom started at 8 o'clock. I had to be home at 9 o'clock. Same night. <laughs> Same night. And uh, I, we were coming down Soul Street, the poor fellow that took me, and racing like crazy because it was like five minutes after and I raced up the steps to get there, you know, and I tripped on the gown and tore it, and it was borrowed. So now I got disciplined for that, very disciplined, because we had to buy the girl a gown, you know. But that's okay, I, I still love them, I love them dearly. <laughs> I'm glad I had them, you know. But uh, no, we were very poor, but uh, that's okay. We learned to appreciate. You know, you don't have to have the, uh, the big name things. You're happy with just anything, mm. you know, so. What sort of aspirations did you have as a young girl? Well, really, I wanted to be a majorette, and uh, I wanted to play the piano. And, uh, oh, I did go to art school. This was, uh, you had to be chosen by the school to go there. And I went into to Carnegie Art Museum every Saturday and um, through the school, but uh, we had to have money for streetcar fare. And um, I won't forget my art teacher as long as I live. To this day, I can make a portrait of her. Her name was Mrs. Lee. And I can make a portrait of her because two Saturdays in a row, my mother did not have streetcar fare to give me, so I was absent. So when I went into the class on the third week, she said, out. And I said, why, what did I do? 
She said, you've been absent for two weeks. I said, my mother didn't have streetcar fare. Too bad. You're out now and go take a streetcar home. To this day, I can paint a picture of her and I guarantee you she'll have horns. <laughs> you know, so that, that disappointed me, but that didn't stop the artwork. I still like to um, draw, sketch, do portraits, and some of my grandchildren have taken after me. In fact, my one granddaughter is in graphic arts. She, she uh, graduated from Pittsburgh, you know, the Art Institute. So, uh, no, I had a lot of aspirations, a lot of dreams, but. I, I'm really happy with everything I had and everything I did. I regret nothing, nothing. Tell me about the majorette program and, and how you first got inspired by that. Well, I was working at Progressive Music. Ed uh, gave me the job in my uh, senior year, about six months before I graduated. And uh, he uh, told me that they were in need of a bookkeeper and a stenographer. And anything that I did do, I made sure that I had good grades, and I worked very hard at it. And uh, uh, they hired me as secretary and stenographer and bookkeeper there. And Claire Laban was the uh, kind of like an auditor. She would come in every few months and check the books and all that to make sure everything was running smoothly. And one day, a school teacher came in, and she asked if anybody there taught baton twirling. And uh, Ed Garbutt looked at me, and I, of course, I shook my head. No, no, please don't. And uh, she said, please, it's for her own enjoyment. I'm not asking for miracles here. So I did take her, and uh, the, the number of students grew rapidly, because there weren't any baton twirling teachers, you know. So then I started to work in the schools, too, was hired by the school districts in four areas to teach their majorettes and so forth. And then it got to be too much between uh, teaching the students at Progressive Music and in the high schools and being bookkeeper and stenographer there. And, uh, and I had started my own little marching group. It got to be too much, so I just kept my marching group, you know. And uh, then that group grew and grew, as you can see from one of the photographs I bought. Uh, it grew and grew and grew. And it's a wonderful, wonderful experience because even to this day, no matter where I go, and my husband will tell you, everybody still remembers me. Oh, Mrs. T, Mrs. T, how are you? You know, And that's such a wonderful feeling. I have never heard anybody say anything badly about me. And I, I took the kids, we went out of state, and we competed in New Jersey and in different uh, Geauga Lake and all that sort of thing. And uh, it was a wonderful experience. The kids all loved it, and they were grateful to me. I took, uh, at one point, seven busloads. These are not school buses. Seven busloads of kids to compete. And we occupied entire motels, all of the rooms, you know. And I am so happy to report that everybody was so very well behaved. They really were, you know. Oh, they would try and commit. I had more adults committing, the chaperones committing pranks than I did the kids, you know. The kids were all good. They were very good. So we would compete, you know. and. Uh, we come out very, very well, very well, you know, in the competitions. So. Now, during your years doing that, what sort of things did you see your students gaining from the experience? First of all, as my husband will tell you, every one of them, even the letters I have at home, they will make you sob. They say they were the best days of their life. Nothing can compare with them. And, and really, I was a, a disciplinarian, but not, not an unreasonable person. Uh, for example, on one of the trips, one of the kids threw their scratch paper out of the window, the bus, onto the parking lot. And I said, okay, everybody out of the buses. I emptied all the buses. I said, now clean up every piece of paper in the parking lot. 
we didn't do anything. I said, that's all right. Now nobody will do anything, you see, and that sort of thing. But uh, no, the kids were good. They were disciplined, but they were good. They were very respectful, very respectful, you know. So I, I think that uh, they gained a lot. I gained an awful lot. It was the time of my life. I have no regrets, none at all. You know, the fun drives, the banquets. Our largest banquet was at the Holiday House. 1,388 people. Hmm. We had to separate people into separate dining rooms for dinner. And we set up the Holiday House theater style because you could not get them all in there, you know. And that's, that's what we did. We had to, we did uh, pretty classy banquets, I'll tell you. Kids were happy to raise the money and this and that, you know, and uh, we met a lot of nice stars and all this and that. It was all worth it. I have no regrets, none at all. I'm just sorry that I had to give it up, and that was only because these steel mills closed and we couldn't raise the money anymore. That breaks my heart, really. That everything has to come to an end. But I have no regrets, none at all, you know. Very interesting. It's, it sounds like a, quite a caper. Yeah, we were constantly raising funds, and uh, the parents were so cooperative. My God, they were so cooperative. Uh, whether it was selling candy bars or, or crates of oranges. At our uh, practice hall, we had uh, uh, large uh, waiting rooms. We even ran a kitchen for the students because our classes, the different classes, different age groups would go from uh, 9 o'clock in the morning till 4 in the afternoon. And teachers and everything had to eat, so there was a kitchen there. So we actually cooked and served you know, for whoever. It was, it was a, an organization that was really unusual. And we were completely independent. We had no sponsors. There were a lot of uh, companies that wanted to sponsor us, but they wanted their names splashed on the back of the uniforms, and we said no, no. So we wouldn't do that. And uh, they worked hard at it. They cooperated. The candy drives, the trucks would deliver the candy and the boxes of candy were piled to the ceiling in very large rooms, you know. So they really worked hard for now, everything. What was the um, interaction with the marching bands? How would that work? Well, we, uh, you know where we ran into problems? For example, Mark, if we had a, uh, a competition anywhere, and many, many times we had band members that also belonged to our group. And uh, there had to be kind of a conflict there, although they always knew, the students my, in my group always knew that the band comes first. No matter what we had to do or where we were competing, you go with your band. You are automatically excused. So that worked out very well, except for one band, and I don't know if I should name it here or not. Is there any problem with naming a band? Okay. Norwin High School Band Director. He is now deceased. Um, what was his name? I can't remember what his name was. Anyhow, he threatened uh, our members, and he said that if you don't quit that drill team, you are out of the band. And uh, we went to them and said, this has nothing, nothing to do with it. They are automatically excused, you know? He didn't want them belonging at all. I had to get an attorney. Hmm. So an attorney had to threaten him and say, you cannot. You have no right over what they do with their free time. And that's the only way we stopped it. But he was rough with the kids. He really was. It's just too bad, you know? Some of, the, some of them quit. I think Dan Yadesky was one that quit his band. Didn't it? Wasn't it Dan? No? No, not Norwin. But if the band directors tried to give an, ult an ultimatum, or this and that. And they did. They just wanted everybody to belong to the band, and that's all, you know. They gave some of the kids a pretty rough time. 
that no, we we were uh, we got along well with the bands in the, whether it was the parades or whatever. We performed with Pitt University on the Keysport High School football field, and they were very very nice. The kids too, they got a big charge out of them, you know. But uh, no, usually we got along very well with the bands. I mean the parades and everything are you know tons of bands, but they are very respectful. I will tell you that. In, uh, we performed we, in Kennywood Park for, I think, 22 years in a row. You know, Kennywood has their fall festi festivals, and they invite one different band each night from the areas. We were invited every night because we accompanied the Queen's float mm -hmm. in Kennywood. And I have to tell you, really, just to show you what good drum teachers we had, Bill Hayward, Dan Yadesky, we had excellent drum teachers, very, very talented, very, very unique in their uh, their drum styles, and you know. And uh, while we would be practicing before the parade, the high school bands they would all come and gather around and watch the drummers. They were really amazed because we had an excellent drum line. Mm. We really did, mm -hmm. you know. Mm. But uh, well, tell me about your time with Progressive. What do you remember about the store? Do you know the store before you started working there? It, when I got the job, when the store was getting ready to open, they had, they had to have a, uh, a bookkeeper and a stenographer, and they had to have somebody order the music. So I would go in after school, and I would order all the music, and I would even order instruments. They would tell me, you know, what they needed and this and that, and I would type up the orders and send them in. So I was there before the store opened. I was there right from the beginning. And everybody was just so very, very nice. They were very good to me. They really were. What do you remember about the store itself? The guys there were crazy. <laughs> they were absolutely wonderful. I can't tell you some of the things on camera. We'll, we'll just <laughs> ignore that. You should be able to tell us at least one or two. <laughs> well, well, the day that Joe Ravella ran out of the store because of what I said, but I was, I, I was young and I, I, I wasn't used to being around people. You have to remember that, that we weren't permitted to do anything or go anywhere or what have you, you know, and. Um, I said, hey, Mr. Ravello, will you do me a favor? I said, would you please go through my desk? Now, Frank Vesley was standing at the register. I said, because Frank, he misbehaves, and if he finds a bug, he puts it in my drawers. Well, Joe, <laughs> Joe ran out of the store, and I'm going, what did I say? What did I say? And, he, and Frank looked at me, and he says, just drop it. <laughs> but that's why I was innocent, you know. I, I didn't know what that that was a desk, you know, <laughs> as far as I was concerned. <laughs> but no, they, they were they were great people. Where was the store located? Eight eleven Walnut Street. I'll never forget that number. And I, I was the, the go person. There was a, a restaurant about a block away. I had to go get their lunches and their coffee. They drank more coffee than I think the whole world consumes, you know. But uh, no, it was 811 Walnut Street. It was across from the, uh, the school, the post office, and the school, Walnut Street School, right in there. Because now you're down on Fifth Avenue, I believe, in Rubenstein's, right? No. Now we had the store on the main floor. And the office was up in the balcony, and sometimes my desk would be down below. They moved it for different reasons, equipment, I think. And then the second floor was uh, teacher's studios, you know. The third floor, they had Corolla Crafts came in and rented the third floor. And this was a, um, uh, like an art studio. And. Uh, so uh, they, they had the, the whole building really pretty busy. But it was, it, there were no problems. There were no problems. The, you know, the neighborhood was fine and everything, you know. But it, um, yeah, we occupied 
three floors, I believe it was. Was there a band repair area? Yeah, second floor. No, wait, the studio was there. I'm trying to figure out where the band, unless that was up on the third floor with Corolla Crafts. That, I'm sorry, I cannot remember, but it was. I have the uh, uh, picture there that, um, that he gave me, the repair shop. Mm. I can't recall if it was second or third floor, no. Tell me about Ed. What, what's your impression of him, and do you know much of his background, how he got there? Well, I know he was an owner, and uh, we were very close, and uh, with his wife Eileen, too. As a matter of fact, I'm godmother to their son. When they had their son, I baptized the baby, and uh, we were very close, and he, he was very funny. He had a way of laughing that you had a laugh, too, because it was a muffled kind of a, a laugh, you know? But uh, he was very nice. They were all great gentlemen, every one of them. And Patsy Oliver, uh, he was teaching trumpet, I believe, at the time. And I don't know if you ever heard of the Patsy Oliver Orchestra? My God. Every bit as good as Harry James, Benny Goodman, all of them put together. I think Patsy has passed away now. I'm not sure, but he also taught privately there. But every one of them, they, they were really very nice, very gentlemanly, you know, and very respectful. And uh, no, there were no problems with them. None of them were nasty or this and that, you know. And uh, no, I, I'm very grateful for that experience too. Thank you for Ed. Thank you, Ed. If you get to see this, I'll never be able to repay you because he made my whole life what it is today, you know. Really great. Now tell us, how long did you stay there? Three years and three months. And I have to tell you how I left, I guess. I didn't leave for any reasons such as that. I became engaged to uh, Frank Zeke, the accordion and piano teacher. And his mother did not like me because I'm Italian. Okay. So she did everything possible to break that up. So I finally had to get out of there. As a matter of fact, it was broken up two weeks before my wedding. We had, I had all my bridesmaids, everybody had their gowns. We had the uh, uh, wedding reception planned and so forth. And the way I got the news was absolutely horrible. I was uh, waiting. We were supposed to go to the florist to pick out our flowers because the wedding was two weeks away. And uh, my cousin, uh, Mario, who's a beautician, uh, came over and said, Helen, I have to talk to you. And I said, uh, uh, Mario, I'm waiting for Frank to come because uh, we're going to the florist. And he said, he's not coming. He's in Florida. I said, what are you talking about? I was with him last night. Well, he flew to Florida because his mother said that she does not want him to marry me. You know, it's even more involved than that, you know. And uh, of course, I collapsed. And they called the doctor. But you know what? It was his loss. It was my gain. <laughs> it was my gain, really and truly. But uh, it was, you know, we all have bad experiences, and that, that, uh, you know, experiences can be bad, but they can be so beneficial, because if you could imagine me being married to somebody that disliked me so badly, because I'm Italian, you know. I didn't know there were any other nationalities in the world but Italian. <laughs> no, that, uh, that's the only sad experience. So I left this, the store. Needless to say, I left it. You know. But you continue with the majorette. Oh, yeah. Program. Yes, I continued with that. And, and um, I didn't need any studio anymore because I had uh, really formed my own group. And we were practicing in veterans' halls and all sorts of things. The, the veterans' groups were very cooperative with me, you know.
because we would be in the parades. We provided music for the veterans groups, you know, because it, most of them didn't have a band or anything like that, so they liked marching with us, you know. So uh, that worked out well. It was okay. Of course, not not everything runs smoothly, as you know, but it everything that happens is an experience, and we all learn from it. You know. So how did you meet this good-looking guy? Oh, I'll tell you. I was very, very, uh, very, very down and very, very depressed. I uh, because my engagement and the wedding and everything was off. I would sit on my porch every night and look up the street and wait for his car to show up, Frank's car to show up. And of course, it never came. And uh, so one day, my girlfriend, Audrey Smith, you know who Audrey Smith is? Okay, she was a fantastic uh, baton twirling teacher for Claret and Honey Bears, right? And uh, she called me, she says, Helen, come on, we gotta get you out of the house. We're going to dance. So we went to the, um, uh, I said, okay. We went to the Palisades and uh, the uh, Speeny, the owner, asked me if I would collect tickets for him because his girl had called off. And I said, sure, okay. So I'm collecting tickets and in walks this guy with a midnight blue suit on. And I said, wow, is he nice looking, you know. Then right behind him comes another fellow with a midnight blue suit. I said, could they be twins? Then a third one came in with a midnight blue suit. I said, my goodness, what is this, you know. So. Uh, the, uh, his brother happened to go sit in uh, one of the chairs there, and it had my jacket on the back of it because I was collecting tickets. And I uh, went over and I said, excuse me, sir, could I have my jacket? And he said, only if you have the next dance with me. So I said, okay, and he danced with my girlfriend. All right. <laughs> but to make a long story short, uh, we began to date after that. And uh, a few months later, we were married. Really interesting. You know what? I'm not this kind of a person. But I will tell you, I would have married him the next day if he'd have asked me, <laughs> really. Because it was just, it was like a gift from God, really. What year was that? that we cel just celebrated our... Uh, 1953. Yeah, we just celebrated our 55th anniversary. Congratulations. Thank wow. you. Yeah, it's a long time. That's why I, I, I can't, un I shouldn't say I can't understand. I think I know what's wrong today with all the divorces and this and that. It's an awful way to say this because it doesn't sound right, but I never drove because we didn't have cars in the family. You didn't drive. And girls didn't, women didn't drive because they would wreck. That's according to my parents. My parents didn't drive either, not even my father, you know. Nobody had a car in the family and so forth. But um, uh, we, we were kind of lucky in a way because when we were married, we did everything together, all the grocery shopping together. I didn't go on my own. And like, because now the, the uh, housewives, they go out with the girls and, and go and have dinner out and have a drink in a bar and this and that. And to me, that's kind of like asking for trouble. You know, you're, you're going to meet guys and this and that, you know. I have my own daughter, Marie, who is a beautiful, beautiful girl. And she went with the girlfriends to celebrate her birthday. And they went to dinner. And um, they ordered drinks, you know. And uh, some, one of the uh, guys sitting at the bar said that he would take the drinks over to the ladies. My daughter, they almost killed her. I mean, she was in the, she was laid up forever because he put something in her drink. She was like totally unconscious for weeks, really bad, see. So I, I, I don't call this a good life. I think we had a good life. We had nothing and we had a good life, you know. Very but, neat. You know, Mark, is there anything else, stories that you have heard or things that you would like to uh, in, have included? One thing that I, I was just thinking about, 
You knew Ed Garvin from McKeesport High School. Yes. I don't think we, we talked about that at all. I mean, what was he like at the high school as the band director? Oh, he was wonderful. He was very understanding. He, I, I did all his, uh, well, we have to call it mimeographing. Now you call it what? Copying and this and that. But I did all his, uh, I mimeographed all the drills and so forth for him. And he was very, very soft-spoken. He was very nice. And he had uh, a very good friend of mine, a bass drummer, Phil Feinert, used to drive him crazy because Phil would never, he was so undisciplined him. Ed would tell him, we're going to do this on this drill. And he says, no, we're not pro. They call him pro. We're going to do what I say. And I'd go, oh, God, don't talk to this man like this. You know? But he was very, very nice, very calm and very good. You never really saw him raise his voice or get rough with anybody. None of them. Not even Larry De, De, Larry De Simone. He was a true clown. I mean, you had to love him. But Ed Garber, he was great. He really was. Was Larry the guy you were telling me about that would do the uh, demonstrations? <laughs> no, no. Uh, Kurt Guckert oh. is the one that uh, would do the demonstrations with um, Frank Vesley, who was the, like the manager of the store, you know. But uh, Larry De Simone was assistant band director, and then he was the junior band director. And he was, he was wild, but he was wonderful. They were, they were, everybody was nice. I, I, I can't tell you that there are any people that I, I disliked. There was no reason to dislike anybody. Mm. But progressive music was um, very well known. Oh, Ed and Maddie Shiner, two brothers, they were absolutely the greatest. And George Franz, I don't know if you, you didn't know George Franz. Yeah, all of them. Now, they were you were there when Bill Schultz was there? Yes. Yes, I was. What do you remember about him? Oh, he was very funny. He was always laughing and very cooperative, no matter how busy he was. If a rush job came in and I'd say, hey, Bill, you know, like, they need this, the high school needs this and this and that. <sighs> okay, I guess I have to do it, you know. But he was, he was very cooperative, really nice. They were hard workers and they really cared. You could see by the pictures that uh, Mark gave me. They were very meticulous in everything they did. That instrument had to be right, you know. No, they were, they were very good. They were a joy to be with, all of them, really. Now, who was your boss? Was it the owner? Owners? I had lots of bosses. <laughs> Ed Garbett, Joe Ravella, Ed Shiner, Frank Vesley. Um, trying to think who else, but the owners are all listed. Th that's your envelope right there. The owners are all listed there. And they were all my bosses, but none of them acted like bosses. Everything was funny to them, really. They would tell about their experiences with uh, uh, this band and that band and, you know, and going out and playing these jobs with the big name bands and, oh, I was so proud. And, you know, nowadays, nowadays, if somebody were to meet Harry James, oh, God, can I have your picture? Can I have your autograph and this and that? And as much as I would love to have done that, I, I could not let them see that I was some little crazy teenager, you know. And, and I could have had all those autographs. I could have had all those pictures. Now I've got nothing but good memories, <laughs> you know. But uh, no, they, they were all very nice. I, I, there was not one of these men that ever said anything out of line to me. Just, just when I told you, what, when Joe Ravella ran out of the store, that was it. <laughs> and then it was explained to me later by Frank Vesley's wife. I had to ask her, Agnes, why, why did they, she says, oh, Helen, why'd you say something like that? I says, well, I don't know, what's it mean, you know? But, uh, <laughs> no, they, they were really very, very good. Very good to me, all of them. What was the bulk of the business then? I mean, was it, it progressive? I mean, was it dealing with schools? Was it rentals? Was it 
Town. With trial rental plan, we, we sold a, a lot of accessories and so forth, you know, reeds and all that kind of stuff and music. But uh, Jesse French pianos went very well. And by the way, my nephew, uh, through me working there, owns a Jesse French piano. It is in his house right there. It was a beautiful piano. And uh, uh, the bulk of it was uh, rental, instrument rentals. There weren't many that were buying instruments because everybody was renting them. And then they would uh, go for the uh, uh, buying them, you know, when they joined the band and this and that. There was no trouble getting anybody to join a band. No trouble at all. Mm -hmm. I think they were just uh, very proud. But now, you know, computers, and like he will tell me, he loves a computer myself. I'd like to get a baseball bat and I'd like to hit our computer. <laughs> because I, you know, he'll, he'll tell me there are so many uh, emails for me and this and that. And I'll say, don't these people clean? Don't they wash clothes? Don't they cook? Don't they do anything, you know? But I, I'm not a fan of the computer. I know they're, there's, um, they're very knowledgeable. You know, you can learn a lot from them. But I also think they're taking away that privilege of me, for example, talking to you and watching your expressions and your smile and this and that as compared to an email. You know, it's, it's not a personal kind of a thing. And I think they miss so much. Maybe I'm wrong, but I like that one-on-one -on -one connection much better, you know. So that's why I think we were so much luckier in a lot of ways, you know. That and, uh, well, even the, the cell phones. God bless the cell phones. You need them. If I didn't have one today, I don't know <laughs> how I would have gotten to touch with you, Mark, you know. But uh, they, they're, they're overdone. The cell phones are overdone. They should be for, you know, purposes like we're saying, emergencies and so forth. But now you see, I just said to him tonight when we were going across the bridge, I said, you know, people don't look like people anymore. They look like space characters. They've got these things on with the antennas up here and, and this and that, you know, but that's, that's all part of them. Um, advancement I guess I don't know I don't know well I don't want his head to get too big but uh, what sort of opinion do you have of this tall guy over oh I love him I love him <laughs> I'll tell you no that's why I I get very upset because he's not married because there's got to be a thousand girls that's looking for him <laughs> really and truly really spoken like a true mom <laughs> 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 yeah, right. Maybe someday the, the right one will just, because I've had a nephew, for example, that says, I'm never getting married. I don't want to have anything to do. Don't even talk to me about a wife. My God, he met this girl and just in just a matter of a few weeks he was married. You know, just, uh, no. Someday maybe, Mark, okay? We'll be invited to the wedding for sure. Good. <laughs> Good. Okay. How did you guys first know each other? You called me. Mark called me on the phone, and I guess Lori had talked to you and say, told you that I was the first bookkeeper there. And, the, and to me, that's an honor, I'm telling you. The first bookkeeper and stenographer, really, I didn't uh, follow anybody. I set up the books. There was a uh, bad experience with a young lady that they hired there, and I, I always worried, dear God, don't let anybody think that that was me because she was a problem, you know. But uh, no, it, it, it was a great experience, it really was. I mean, I, I learned an awful lot being there, you know. Very kind, nobody ever hurt my feelings, nothing, you know. It was great, it really was. Very neat. I was sort of curious, did your parents were they born in the States? My parents were born in Italy. I had a feeling. <laughs> yeah, they, they were born in Italy, I'll tell you. And uh, they got married in Italy. And uh, 
they had 11 children, but three, the first three boys died, you know. So, uh, but the rest of us, well, I have a lot of my siblings have passed away since, you know. But uh, they had a very hard job, you know. You have twins and a little girl. Can you imagine trying to feed all those people? and clothe them. And I can boast of one thing. I had one dress for Easter. That's all. Because that's all you got was one dress. But I'm not angry. I still love them. I know they tried their best. You know. Now why did they settle in Pittsburgh? Do you know? Uh, it, we had a, 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 they had an uncle here living here that had already come from Italy. And you know, the one thing I can't understand about um, uh, sending your kids overseas to live, they could tell me until they're blue in the face that they sent their children to America for a better life. You would never get me to send my kids anywhere for a better life. I want them with me. I want them in my pocket. <laughs> you know, I, I don't understand that. I really don't. I, I can't accept that. The fact that my mother and my aunt came over here and uh, left, said goodbye to their parents, never to see them again. I couldn't deal with that. Could you deal with that? Never. I don't understand. It's a different era, I guess. Mm. I don't know what it is. I'll because tell it you. wasn't just your family. Lots of people. No, were that's right. They did. They did. They said we couldn't feed them. That's why we sent them over here. I won't eat. That'll keep my kids there. You know? I, 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 I don't understand. Maybe they don't have. Well, they, I can't say they didn't have affection because they certainly did. But maybe it's a different kind of affection, you know? Well, maybe they didn't want their kids to grow up where they were. And, you know, America at that time was the promised land, so I, I, they I, wanted something better for them. I'm sure, but I still couldn't. I still couldn't do that. I still couldn't say goodbye to my kids. My God, my granddaughters go to college, and you would think that I just, <laughs> I just lost my life. God. <laughs> <laughs> my my uh, one little granddaughter, Giovanna, she goes to Goucher College, and one of the requirements at Goucher is that you must spend one semester overseas somewhere. And where did she pick? Australia. She was in Australia for five months. And she says, you know what, Graham? When I graduate, I'm going to move to New Zealand, because she loved it so much. And I said, not till grandma's dead. <laughs> they're, they're a different breed, I'll tell you. They're a different breed. They, they don't, uh, and, and don't get me wrong, I, you know, they have to live their own life and this and that, but I want them around me. I really do. <laughs> well, you have two daughters? Is that right? Two daughters and six granddaughters. Yeah, they're all, they're all really very special. Of course, they think Grandma's crazy because I tell them all these stories, you know. We were discussing the music store and all this and that, you know. And they laugh and laugh, you know. Of course, they're, they're, they look for higher things than being a bookkeeper. But no, I was happy with it. I was happy with it. Especially uh, helping to get a new business going, you know. I feel kind of a little bit responsible for that, and yet they are totally responsible for all the people now that I have met in my lifetime. Because when you figure over 10,000 members, you figure add up their parents, their grandparents, their aunts, their uncles, and so forth. And before you know it, the whole world knows you, and you know the whole world, you know? It's, it's really great. They did a lot for me. I owe progressive music a lot. I will always be indebted to progressive music. Always. And look, I met you guys too. 
<laughs> See, that's a plus. That's a big plus. <laughs> Thank you. You too. So. Good stuff. Do you guys, can you think of something else that would be uh, germane to add? <laughs> when you became a major, uh, but in high school, you didn't say anything about that. <laughs> oh, oh my God. <laughs> my father. Uh, I was not allowed to try out for major ed because they wore short skirts, see? And he said, y no, you, you can't go. So um, my mother says, go ahead, you can try out. So I did, and I made it. And the first football game, you know, September is warm, you know? And uh, I says, Mom, how am I going to get to the game when Daddy sees me in this short skirt? My God, he's going to go crazy. And she says, go up and get your coat. Well, your coat meant coat. It was a long winter coat down here. So I come downstairs with this coat on, and, and Dad says, what are you doing with that coat on? And I says, oh, Dad, I have the chills. And this, that. He says, well, then where are you going? I says, I'm just going to go see the football game. So I, I went to, um, I went to the, the game because I was performing. Wouldn't you know it, that night, and I don't know if one of those pictures there might be, that night the Daily News came and took a picture of the majorettes. <laughs> the next day it was in the newspaper, and my father had this paper going all over the neighborhood. This is my daughter. This is my daughter, you know. He was then became very proud. Then with my uh, drill team, uh, we ordered uniforms from Feckheimer, Oswald, I don't know if you know those names. Uh, they, they were not uh, made by seamstresses, they were professionally made, you know. And when the uniforms come in, I would have all the girls and boys come to my house to be fitted for their uniforms. And you should have seen him. He was hiding way far away behind a garage so he wouldn't have to look at these girls in, in short skirts. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but no, it, it, he was all right. What sort of line of work was he in? He worked at Vercel Cemetery digging graves. They did not have a um, um, machinery at the time. This was all by hand, all by hand. And he would come home and tell us stories that we were, that were just almost incredible, uh, you know, of uh, cemetery, people at funerals and this and that, and their behavior and so forth. But he worked very, very hard. He worked very hard. Tried their best, you know, that's all they could do, but there wasn't excess money, there wasn't enough money but we got through it. Yeah, we got through it. But uh, no, as far as uh, making it for majorette, that was, that was a great experience for me. That I owe to progressive music too, you know, because uh, trying out for majorette and uh, being with a high school band, because I was still in school when I was hired by progressive music. I was still in school. No, they're, they did a lot for me. They really did. I'm truly grateful to them. Fun stuff. Yeah, right. Right. Mark, can you think of anything else? You covered it pretty well. Yeah, yeah very well. Yeah. With good enthusiasm. Yes. Well, thank you. I will and be listened to. Well, thank you. And uh, there's uh, one of the Pittsburgh Steelers that played drums for my group. <laughs> and that, that makes me feel very good, you know. And uh, we've had a lot of nice publicity in magazines. That's not the only magazine that the, uh, that the group had pictures in. But uh, no, a lot of nice things have happened in the group. Who was your largest? The largest group, what was it, 72 or 74? Oh, I mean the, the, the size? 388. What? Oh, my. 388 <laughs> kids. 
after 100 names. That's why when we would go anywhere to compete, whether it was Wildwood, New Jersey, where was whatever, we had to occupy the whole motel, all of the rooms. And the kids, I gave them instructions, you know, on, on everything. They says, Mrs. T, when are we going to get time to read this? There would be over 200 instructions in a booklet that I had printed. When you take a shower, you, you put the, the, you know, the uh, plastic curtain on the inside and the cloth curtain on the outside and all this and that, you know. And I said, and, and stay away from that pool. The, they have hours here, and you have to be in bed at certain times. So one night, the owner of the Admiral came, uh, came, knocked on our door. It was like in the middle of the night, and he said, That's all right. Do you want to take that? No, no. And he said, Helen, he says, I I'm sorry to bother you, but he said, there are people in the pool. I said, what? He said, there are people in the pool. And it was in the middle of the night. So uh, I go out. To, I was going to really get upset with them. It was the parents in the pool. <laughs> The kids were all in bed, and the parents are swimming away in the pool. I said, oh, my God, i got to discipline them, too, you know. <laughs> Give the instructions and the rules to the parents. Yeah, right. That's, that's true, I'll tell you. But, no, they enjoyed it. We'd take these bus loads, and, God, they enjoyed it. That's why they said it was a time of their life. We had, well, I would just tell you quickly, we had one little incident this uh, young girl. Oh, by the way, I had three nurses with the group constantly. Mm. It went everywhere with us. And um, this one girl, she was about, uh, what would you say, about 16 years old, 15 or 16 till. Anyhow, she um, uh, had never seen the ocean before. and She was deathly afraid. So one of the nurses had to sleep with her because she had it in her mind that the ocean was going to wash up and it was going to drown her, you know. So I felt so sorry for her because she just didn't know anything about oceans and so forth. So she got through that trip okay and we were all very glad. And about two weeks later she was killed by a truck on Brazil's Avenue. There she was worried about the ocean, you know. But she had a good time when she was with us anyhow. But no, I had three nurses. The kids were very, very well taken care of. And the one thing I do, and this is very important where teenagers are concerned, the teenagers in those days took care, total care, of the little ones. See, I had a freshman, junior, and a senior group. I had three groups. And the um, seniors would constantly take care. When we're lining up, for a parade or whatever, the seniors were always, come on, move out of the way, honey. You see these fire trucks are coming? Move out of the way, and they would take care of them. They really looked out for them. So, so they learned more than marching or playing an instrument. They learned how to care about each other, mm -hmm. and that was good. There's, there's so many things. and Like I said, everything still goes back to progressive music. Without progressive music, there would be none of that. None of that. I just wish those guys were around for me to thank them. I'd like to thank them. But maybe somehow they know, right? Yeah. No, that's really great. Very nice. Thank you very much for your time. Well, that's all right. I, I, I hope there's something there that you can use, you know. It's, uh, Absolutely. Good stuff. Well. Yeah. What do you think? It's amazing. Yeah. Oh. I, absolutely. You're hired. <laughs> 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 well, no, like I say, it's all, it's all because of progressing. I'm not trying to impress you, Mark. I told you that the last time. It's all because of progressive music. That's who I've got to thank, really and truly. All the way down to even the broken engagement, because then I met him. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> See? <laughs> you know, as a football game at the key sport, whatever old major rest that I recognize comes down to me, she says to me, my life, my life ended when I <laughs> left the drill team. She says, that has been yeah. the same since. Yeah. Wow. So you right. think it's an awful lot of that. Oh, God. And the letters and so forth. And they'll, they'll come to the house. My doorbell rang not too long ago. And there was one of the boys was a drummer in my group. And he was home on leave from Iraq. And he came and he had a plant, a flower in his hand to give me. And he just took my breath away, you know, because I thought that was so nice. It's nice to be remembered in the right way. That's why I can't understand I can't understand the, the crime today, the drugs, the, the, the uh, trouble that they, uh, the young people get into. I, I can't understand that because it's such a wonderful feeling to do everything right, not just something, everything right. Mm -hmm. Give it your all, you know. You See? don't get involved with things like this, no. No, I know. I know that's so sad. That's why I say when I become president of the United States, <laughs> everybody that commits a crime, I'm going to tattoo their cheek permanently. I am a criminal. <laughs> hey, you have my vote. Now I know who <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to vote for. <laughs> no, it's the, uh, the uh, system is really off base. They should not get away with this. I believe in an eye for an eye. I really do. You know, but you guys have been absolutely wonderful. Fun stuff. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Like I said.